Hi, everybody. This is Glenn Barnes from the Environmental Finance Center at UNC. Thanks for joining us this afternoon. Uh, and we've got people joining from around the country. Um, this is not a, a super formal webinar. It's really just an opportunity for us at the Environmental Finance Center network team to give all of you an update on where we are with our training and technical assistance grant with EPA. We're about at the halfway point and just wanted to give you an update on how things are going. Um, answer any questions that you have and, and share a few stories from the field. Um, so just based on the, the number of attendees that we have, uh, we do have to keep everybody on mute. Um, so if you do have questions, uh, we'll want you to go ahead and use the question box on the, um, on the GoToWebinar screen to submit those questions and we'll answer them for you. Uh, just real quick on the agenda for today, so we'll give you a quick update on the project progress, share some stories from our educational programs and technical assistance around the country, look ahead to the next round of funding, and then answer any questions that you have. And I have uh, several colleagues joining today, including Heather Himmelberger and uh, Daniel Irvin, Tom Roberts, Stephen Lapp, and, and others, so um, you'll be hearing uh, from a few of us today. So we'll, we'll go ahead and jump in on this. Um, just as a quick reminder, uh, the Environmental Finance Center Network is one of the grant recipients for the Training and Technical Assistance Grant. Technically, uh, us at UNC are the recipient, but it's on behalf of the network, and we are university and nonprofit-based organizations that provide training and technical assistance to environmental service providers around the country, uh, including and especially on drinking water. And uh, I think most of you know us, but here is our project team. And then just to highlight, um, which is a new feature this year on our team, is that we have both uh, the Government Finance Officers Association, GFOA, and the National Association of Development Organizations, or NATO, as partners. And they have been great to work with as we are going out and doing our training and technical assistance work. So we are here to talk about the uh, funding from US EPA to provide training and technical assistance to small drinking water systems. Uh, we at the Environmental Finance Center Network have received the financial and managerial capacity dollars, and then our good friends at National Rural Water Association and RCAP have the technical capacity grants, and RCAP has a few others on private wells and on septic uh, systems and things like that. So again, our uh, slice of this overall pie is just the finance and management, and that's what we'll be talking about today. And I think many of you are, are familiar with the work we do, but for us, finance and management includes a, a wide range of subjects, asset management, rate setting, leadership, water loss reduction, energy management planning, accessing infrastructure finance programs, workforce planning, water conservation finance, system collaborations, resiliency, managing drought, and, and so on. And we have had conversations with those of you in states and in the regions at the beginning of this project round and talked about your priorities. And we are in the midst now of implementing that, uh, that scope of work on these various subject areas. So we were working all across the country, all 50 states, all five territories, and the Navajo Nation, and then also a special focus on tribal water systems as well. Um, all of this is the same as over the past five or six years we've had this project. And uh, we've really had a wide range of systems, uh, small water systems that we work with, small by EPA's definition being 10,000 or fewer people. Um, but that includes local governments, tribes, mobile home parks, condos, restaurants, hospitals, shopping malls, schools, marinas, hotels, office buildings, water bottling plants, the Oklahoma City Zoo, uh, the aquarium on St. Thomas. So any, you know, any and all regulated federal water systems we're, we're touching with this project, and we can work with any of them, community and non-community, transient and non-transient. So the, the big progress update really is uh, that things are going really well. Um, we have a suite of services of both live content that includes webinars, workshops, comprehensive technical assistance, small group sessions on revenues and cost savings, 
funder forums where we ask the infrastructure funding programs to come and present on their programs and answer questions from water systems. And then working with financial regulators, including you know, utility commissions and public service commissions. Those are kind of the services we provide where we have a live audience either in front of us or over the uh, internet. And then we have some on-demand services as well, such as rates dashboards, blog posts, educational videos, and then the recordings of all of our webinars. And all of these services are in good shape right now. We're about halfway through the calendar and a little bit less than halfway through kind of the period in which we're offering the services. And uh, we have done more than half of our, our workshops, more than half of our webinars, um, more than half of our technical assistance. So we're on track with, with everything. And what I really want to remind everybody is that the best place to look for updates on all of this is the project website, which is efcnetwork.org. And I'm just going to exit out of my PowerPoint real quick and pull that up for you on the screen. So uh, this is our, our website. And if you go on the top here to workshops and webinars and click on upcoming events, uh, what you'll see here is a map of the country with pins in them where we have things scheduled and they get on our website once they're totally scheduled and we start advertising. And then you can scroll down and, and see some of the upcoming events. So for example, next week, Heather Himmelberger and I will be in Cambridge, Ohio, uh, doing this first workshop here, Tips to Meet Ohio's New Asset Management Regulations. I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, program a little bit later in the hour. Uh, we have a webinar next week on how to motivate your employees and keep your customers happy. And then uh, from there, we have workshops in Texas, California, Colorado, Delaware, Utah, New Jersey, et cetera. So uh, all of our past events are also listed on the website. So you can click on the past events tab and you can see our most recent events were uh, in Puerto Rico. Over the last couple days, a webinar we did um, this past week, um, a workshop in Arizona that Heather will talk a little bit more, one we did in the Virgin Islands last week, and so on. So all of these are here. And then um, for many of the workshops, like if you click on Air Arkansas, for example, which we did a, a rate setting workshop, and scroll to the bottom, what you'll actually find here on some of them are the presentation files. So um, this is a workshop that I led, and you can go in here and pull up all of the presentations that we did for that particular workshop are, are all there. So uh, anyway, this is a good site. Um, if you're curious of how things are going on the, on the project and want to learn more about it, you can obviously reach out to us at any time. The other just couple things I'll highlight while I'm here is if you have a system interested in technical assistance, they can come here, click on assistance, and click on request assistance. And this will pull up a little form that they fill out that comes to us and we'll follow up with them. And then under our resources tab here, we have our resource library, we have our e-learning modules, and then we have our list of funding sources by state or territory are all available. So, um, you know, the, the update is, as I said, things are, um, things are going really well with the project, and we're excited about um, where we're at in terms of the uh, in terms of where we're at with the deliverables. And uh, not every workshop has been completely planned to the point of us having a date or a venue selected, but um, we've got our topics and our trainers assigned for everybody. So uh, it's always good to do these calls and not have a lot of exciting things to talk about. It's always actually good to kind of have a lot of boring stuff to talk about because things are going well. Um, but what we wanted to do was to dedicate uh, a chunk of time to share some stories from the field. So what is going well um, in our work, in our educational programs, or in our technical assistance work. And the idea here is to give you a sense of um, the type of work we are doing or could be doing for small systems in your state or territory or in your region. And so uh, our colleague Heather Himmelberger is, is uh, with us today. Heather, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Um, so you wanted to share, I think, a couple stories about uh, your workshop this week and maybe a few others. Yeah, thank you. And I apologize in advance for any uh, background noise. I'm sitting in a uh, hospital waiting area, so I apologize for that. 
but I will do my best to try to keep it um, brief and hopefully few as interruptions as possible. But I was just going to mention our Arizona Water Loss Training that we did just this past week, and um, it was tied into the state is moving forward on a pilot project that allows systems to get some more in-depth help on audits. So it's kind of nice that out of our workshop, a couple of utilities would like to participate in their um, their future water loss trainings, and they got a good introduction of what data to pull together, how the audits are going to work, and one utility came up and said now they felt like they had enough information to actually go and do their audit on their own. So what we'll do is they're going to go back, do the audit, then they're going to send the audit to me, and we'll pick them up as a TA after that and give them advice on kind of go, going forward and how to look at their audits. So I think lots of really good outcomes out of that training. Um, and training that was pretty well attended, 40-some people were there. Um, I was just going to mention a couple of other things that have been going on. We've done a lot of work with mapping for small water utilities, uh, where we're um, trying to get them started on mapping as like a first step in the asset management process. And just getting the systems out there with some um, pretty simple technology that you can do on a smartphone, they can do a very quick um, uh, asset inventory. They can put put it into a couple of different formats, like even a MapQuest map is possible. And they learn a lot about their system by walking around the system and doing um, data collection. I was going to mention that we did a regionalization training in CNMI, the Commonwealth of Nor Northern Mariana Islands, uh, a couple of months ago. And out of that training, um, their interest in starting one of the WARN groups those are the assistance after natural disasters and things. There isn't one of those right now in the territories, and they're thinking about starting one of those and maybe located it, locating it with the, um, uh, the environmental agency over there. And they also decided to reinvigorate their own group that they used to have that was for facility managers and make that a little broader and include operators as well. And they were supposed to be scheduling a meeting a couple of months after we had our training. And they really wanted to get that going again. And it kind of lapsed for a couple of years. So I think our training is going to start them on the path to having their own regional group. And then in New Mexico, we did a regionalization training about a month and a half ago or so. Or no, I'm sorry, that one was um, back in December. We did a different training in New Mexico. Um, so this regionalization training was the largest attendance we've had for any training in years. We had about 50 people signed up, you know, in a matter of a couple of weeks, which showed us that there's a lot of interest in that topic in the state, and there hasn't really been that kind of interest for a while. So it's kind of really cool to see that the whole idea of partnering and working together is becoming a bigger interest, uh, not just in New Mexico, but you know, um, we're seeing a re revitalization in that topic where for a couple of years nobody seemed, you know, no water system seemed too, too interested, but now we've seen this uptick. Um, and the last one I'll mention is we've been working with a tribe and one of their concerns um, was grants management and how best to handle grants and kind of working with engineers on that whole project-oriented stuff that gets into a different side of managerial capacity. And we had a training for them uh, a few weeks back. And they invited not just the people that do the water grants, but people that do other types of environmental grants within their agency. So it'll have a bigger reach than just the water folks. And it will help them going forward in a lot of different areas, like setting up milestones, looking at outcomes and outputs tracking their finances, um, and we also touched on things like capital improvement planning, asset management, and a host of other topics within the confines of grants management. And um, uh, Glenn and I are thinking of doing a series of webinars on this topic because we feel like probably others could benefit from just overall grants management, you know, not just how do you write the grant, but what do you do after you get it, and how would you be involved in the design process, and and the alternative evaluation, and then once you get the money, sort of those outcomes and outputs and milestones along the way. So I think stay tuned on that one. Um, sometime probably this fall or late summer, we'll put out some webinars on this particular topic, and it might be an offering that would be possible to um, provide to states in the future if you would like a training of this type. So I think I'll stop there. 
And again, I apologize if there was background noise, but um, um, I haven't figured out how to be in two places at once, so this is the best I could do. So uh, thanks for bearing with me. Uh, Heather, real quick before you uh, before you leave us, could you just maybe say a couple words about the Bureau of Indian Education uh, webinars we have coming up? Yeah, um, what Glenn is referring to is there's some issues that I'm sure many of the states are aware of with lead in schools and the whole concept of um, uh, how you're going to address those kinds of issues. So we've been talking to the Bureau of Indian Affairs about getting involved with them to partner up and do some webinars and some other types of training perhaps around those kinds of issues, operator certification issues, operator training, um, you know, the whole issue of lead in schools. So I think that'll be a really good partnership and it's one that will bring um, part of the tribal water world that's not really connected that well with existing resources through Indian Health Service or others into um, a place where they can get some of these services. So they've been kind of more on the outskirts um, uh, as opposed to like the regular community drinking water system. So this will be a really nice partnership and a nice ability to work together. Okay, great. Thank you, Heather. Um, we also have Tom Roberts on, who is the uh, Community Assistance Manager uh, based with the UNC Environmental Finance Center. Uh, Tom, are you on the line? I am. Great. Um, can you share uh, maybe a couple stories from some of the technical assistance work you've been doing over the last couple months? Yeah, I'd love to. Thanks, Glenn. And uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm going to share two stories, two, two short stories. Um, sort of uh, vignettes of some of the technical assistance we've been doing. Uh, one of them is a town in uh, west central North Carolina, a town called Moxville. Um, and this is a, a town the size that has 2,600 or so connections, uh, water connections, population of just under 4,700 uh, people. Um, and this one came to us uh, directly from the finance director. And um, it, it's actually somebody we had worked with in the past who had been with a different town in that area. Um, last year, we had done a bunch of work for her for her um, budget submissions, both in uh, rates design and, and um, financial health and that kind of thing. And she, she took on a different position in a, in a bigger town, um, not big, just bigger. And uh, she reached out to us directly and said, hey, could you do something for us here? And we're, of course, good. And they had a new town manager, um, and, and they were getting ready to go into their budget process, which runs from the middle of the year to middle of the year in um, North Carolina. And so they had, they had a pretty simple uh, goal. They, they wanted to make their enterprise fund self-sufficient. It had been leaning on the general fund for a number of years and had accumulated um, on paper a uh, re rather significant uh, loan amount that it had gotten from the general fund. And the uh, town commissioners had actually enacted a, uh, a uh, ordinance, I'll say, to uh, commit to paying back the general fund over a period of time um, for, that, for the uh, money that, that, that the general fund had lent to the enterprise fund. Which is pretty unusual. We don't. We might see some money going back to the general fund, but they had actually formalized this in a public document that they had voted on, um, so that uh, their town had seen uh, their commitment, um, and and so they're, they're committed to doing that. But they also knew that to make that successful, they needed to look at their rates. Um, when we did their financial health checkup, they were actually not in that bad a shape, um, but they knew they, that they had some investments they had to make and they wanted to make this uh, uh, pay back to the general fund. So we provided them uh, the, both the financial health checkup and we did a, a little quick affordability assessment. And then the meat of it was a rates tool that we walked through um, the, finance, the finance officer and the town manager prior to their budget retreats with their commissioners. And it had gotten them comfortable enough that um, we had gone through a number of scenarios, but we also gave them enough comfort that they could do it on the fly as their um, 
commissioners have some questions. Well, what if we do this or what if we do that? That kind of thing. And so ultimately, they they've um, they've agreed to a four percent increase for their inside town customers and an eight percent increase for their outside town customers, which was a little lower than what we had suggested, but it's a start in the right direction. And uh, I commend them for for doing that. And just by looking at at the minutes from their board retreats, you can see that they were um, they had been listening to what we were saying about being a self-sufficient enterprise fund, and that they needed to look at rate increases and they needed to invest. So um, that was a win on our uh, from our point of view that we had educated them to that point. So that one's kind of I'll call it complete. Although I expect that we'll hear back from them again. Um, the other one we're working on, which is ongoing. Is a town in New Hampshire named Claremont, New Hampshire, and this is a town of about 3,600 connections, a population of about 9,000 people. And this one came direct from the New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services. This was a town that, quite frankly, the real driving force, uh, at least to start with, was is they had about 50 percent non-rev non-revenue water, and they and they knew they had a need for an asset management uh, um, initiative, and we've We've given that we've given them the uh, contacts for others on the EFC network, and my understanding is is they're working with uh, others, uh, other EFCs uh, on the non-revenue and the asset management. We but we were able to help them with their financial position, so uh, we did again a baseline of their current financial position using the financial health checkup tool, and then we again the rates becomes a big part of it, and they had. Um, decreasing block rates, uh, and um, they were looking to see if they could increase rates. Um, but they want they were looking at different ways of, you know, they they were kind of slicing it as every which way they can. So we we uh, modified our existing tools so that they could put in different percentages for the base and the first block for residential and the commercial industrial blocks and so it was a, an example of, of one that we've kind of modified for somebody specific and um, you know we, we spent a, a good hour maybe an hour and a half on a, a go uh, a, a go to meeting to review that and then um, they've also asked us just recently to, to, to uh, give them a little guidance on the capacity fees which we have and we're kind of going back and forth on that we still got a little bit of reach work to go but both of those are, uh, you know, are uh, wins from our point of view. Uh, educated on the Claremont one, we had both the finance officer, uh, the public works assistant, public works director, and the public works director all intimately involved. And of course, the state is very interested in how that's going. So, those are my two uh, stories from the field. All right, great. Thanks, Tom. Uh, we've also got Daniel Urban here, uh, who's our uh, Community, uh, what is your title? I forget. <laughs> Environmental Finance Community Advisor. Community Advisor. And we're actually, on, sadly, losing Daniel in just a matter of weeks to Stanford uh, for grad school. But um, do you want to tell us about some of your wrap, your work uh, wrapping up with us? Yeah. Um, so I'm going to talk about a another technical assistance um, that was a little more data intensive. Um, this is one we completed for Roseboro. North Carolina. It's a small, low-income town in, in rural North Carolina. Um, and the mayor and the finance officer actually attended uh, a small systems workshop in North Carolina last December. Um, and so from that workshop uh, came to us for some some technical assistance. Um, and their their big issue was that they have they have pretty low rates um, and uh, they're very but they're also very concerned about affordability. So they're trying to figure out how to how to generate revenue for to replace aging infrastructure. I think they, they need some new wells, things like that. Um, so like I said, they have low rates and a, a three thousand gallon allowance included with their base charge, which um, just means that their base fee is about eighteen dollars for water, and with that, they uh, residential users get about three thousand gallon allowance. Um, so the bulk of what we we did for them was analysis on their sort of customer level usage data. So they sent us um, 12 years worth, uh, or 12 months, sorry, worth of um, uh, build usage data. 
and we analyzed sort of uh, where their different uh, users were falling in terms of their, their usage patterns, um, and, and especially in terms of how, how Rosebro might be able to, to generate revenue. So we, we used that data to create you know, three different rate scenarios for them. Uh, one, where we kept sort of that usage allowance where it was, but raised rates across the board. Um, especially focusing on some of their outside rates and their bulk, uh, bulk user rates, which were which are pretty low relative to their inside rates. Um, another scenario, looking at the impact of reducing the allowance to 2,000 gallons, and then a, a final scenario where we uh, converted the allowance to a uh, a small a, a, a first tier uh, with a very small volumetric rate. Um, and so Tom and I uh, traveled to Roseboro to pre present, present the results in person to the mayor and their finance officer. Um, and we also wrote up a memo kind of summarizing their different options. Um, and we just saw through the news uh, through the news a couple of days ago, they did approve a rate increase for next year. Um, folk, and it's mainly focused on raising their, their outside rates and bringing them more in line with, with uh, sort of the state average in terms of the, the differential there. So that was sort of the, the scenario one we presented to them. Um, but one thing we were able to sort of stress to them uh, that, was, that was a takeaway we hope they, they got from it was that based on their, their usage, um, they were in the long run either going to have to change that allowance either by reducing it or getting rid of it entirely or um, increase their base charge um, pretty significantly because about half of all their usage um, was in that allowance. So um, that was sort of what we were able to do with the data, kind of show them in the long terms where their, uh, where their rates would have to be at um, given their, their sort of status as a small, uh, small town. So. Okay, great. Uh, thanks, Daniel. And then uh, this is Glenn again. I just wanted to share a, a quickly about a couple of upcoming educational programs we have um, in Ohio next week and in Connecticut this fall. And each of these states has recently introduced a, um, a statewide asset management requirement for water systems. And so um, we have been working very closely with our contacts in the primacy agencies of both states um, to address the, um, the particular regulations that are coming into play and focusing on, on specific types of systems. And so taking normal trainings that we have, for example, the Ohio requirements include an asset management plan, a water loss audit, and a succession plan. And so we're taking elements of several different workshops and putting them together into a customized workshop specifically around this particular new requirement. And then for Connecticut, what we're looking at doing is a workshop and then a series of webinars and specifically targeting non-governmental systems serving 1,000 or fewer people who are going to be subject to this asset management requirement in the state. So. Those were just a couple of quick examples of, um, of some of the upcoming uh, work that, workshops that we're having where you know, we're taking our normal subject and kind of bending it and, and tailoring it specific needs in states and in, in particular when there are uh, these new requirements coming out. So uh, we had a question come in uh, from Daria about uh, work that's going on in American Samoa. I'm not sure if Heather is still on the line, but what we've been doing in American Samoa the, uh, the last couple of years is helping uh, ASPA, their, their uh, island-wide system, with their non-revenue water and water loss. And I know Heather and her colleague were out there last year doing a lot of on-the-ground work of measuring uh, water loss. And, and trying to help them reduce that number. And I believe our plan going forward is to continue doing more of the same work this year so we continue to be in close contact with, uh, with our friends down at, down at ASPA. So uh, Daria, thanks for uh, submitting that question. Um, so we're, we're getting to the point where we'd love to hear any questions that, uh, other questions that you have. So please use the question box uh, for that. But just looking ahead, um, I wanted to give you a quick update on kind of where the project is going from here. So um, this particular round of the project, uh, as I mentioned, is going to run through 
we're about halfway through and it will run through January 31st of 2019. That's when we anticipate having all of our deliverables finished. Uh, we have already uh, been fortunate enough to win an additional round of funding for this project from US EPA. Um, we're expecting to sign the award with EPA on or about September 1st of this year, which is when we'll start to reach out to you in states and territories and regions uh, to set up the call to talk about what's coming up. Uh, the one thing that is a little bit different about this particular um, round of funding is in the past it has been essentially for one calendar year's worth of work. This one is actually two calendar years worth of work. So it'll be for 2019 and 2020 and uh, calendar years. And what we would like to do is when Heather and I and others are, are going to do the calls this fall is to talk with you about potentially about a multi-year strategy for working with small systems in your state and then at, you know, around a year after that in the fall of 2019, we'll check back in and see if what we had thought about for 2020 still holds or if there's new or different uh, priorities that have come up, we can make changes. So we want to be really flexible, but I think it's nice to be able to have a little bit of a longer planning horizon um, with states and, and territories which we've not been able to have before. So that's really exciting, and again, we're very grateful to, uh, to EPA for uh, putting their trust in us to continue doing this project, which we've been you know, now doing since 2012. Um, one quick thing I wanted to mention, some of you may have heard that a, a little of our money and money going to rural water and RCAP um, from that uh, solicitation from EPA was included in President Trump's rescission package, and uh, that was true initially, it seems like our funding was eventually taken out. Um, the House and Senate saw the value of this project and took it out, and it doesn't seem that the rescission bill is going to pass. Uh, regardless, that was just voted on and, and voted down in the Senate the other day. Um, but it, for those of you who may have heard that news and were worried that there might have been some significant cuts, it, it seems that uh, we're in good shape. So um, that's kind of the, the latest update there. So um, here is uh, contact information for uh, myself and Heather and Chris Dodson. So Heather and I are the uh, co-directors of the project, and Chris from our sister center in Syracuse uh, is the managing director, so basically keeping the, the trains running on time and making sure we're meeting all our deliverables. And uh, if you have any questions about how the progress is going in your state or region, or um, things we might be able to do, or if from hearing some of the stories we told, if that gives you some ideas of systems to work with uh, that we could be working with, please, please, please uh, don't hesitate to reach out to any of the three of us and we'll uh, be delighted to, uh, to chat with you and catch you up on the project and, and see what we could do. So um, that's it for the, uh, the formal content, but I do want to uh, see if anybody else has questions uh, that we could answer for you. So again, please utilize the questions box. Um, so click on that little orange arrow and there's questions box there. If you have any questions, we'll, we'll hang out for a couple minutes and uh, see if we can answer any. But again, uh, this is not your only chance. Please, please feel free to reach out to us at, at uh, any time. And um, just while we're giving you a minute to get any questions submitted, uh, I mentioned that Daniel, after a couple years of great service on the project, is, is moving on. So we're uh, very thankful to Daniel, and, and Stephen Lapp is uh, taking over for Daniel as our kind of financial number cruncher. Uh, so Stephen's sitting with us here. You want, why don't you say hi? Um, hi, uh, my name's Stephen Lapp. Uh, I'm a recent graduate from UNC Chapel Hill and, and have started transitioning at the Environmental Finance Center at Chapel Hill, and I'm delighted to be working with these intelligent people and to hear about all the good work everyone's doing. Okay, great. Thank you, Stephen. And also just wanted to mention a, a number of you through the years have gotten to know our uh, colleague Stacy Barrager, who works for the Environmental Finance Center at UNC. Um, Stacy is uh, very sadly leaving us after 14 great years of service to the EFC. Uh, she and her husband are uh, going on some new exciting uh, uh, ventures in their life, and so we wish Stacy well. Her, um, she's still technically uh, employed with us for a little while longer, but essentially at this point has wrapped up her work. So I um, just want to wish Stacy well as uh, as she moves on as well. So um, 
Again, if you have any questions, please go ahead and, and submit them. We'll give you another another minute or two. Um, and Heather, if you're still on, or our friends in Syracuse, I don't know if you have anything you would like to add as well while we uh, while we have the audience. We don't have anything to add here in Syracuse, Glenn. Okay. All right. Well, I am uh, not seeing any questions come in, so I think we'll go ahead and uh, close up. I do see up. questions, actually. Um, I don't know. Maybe okay. we're not getting them, but I can ask. It looks like we have at least four. Oh, there we go. Yeah. Okay, excellent. Sorry, I was not seeing those. Um, Okay, so sorry, we had a we had a question about the two states um, that have the asset management requirements. Uh, so one is Ohio, and the other is Connecticut. Um, both of those are, are fairly new asset management regulations. Um, so that was uh, Corin's question. Um, Denise had also asked, "Where can I get more information?" Um, I think the, the Ohio ones are actually new enough that uh, I don't think they've been published on the web yet. Um, they've just finalized the rules. Um, the Connecticut ones, I think, are up on the website. And I will add some other states, including Michigan, have come out with asset management requirements. I believe maybe Iowa is looking at this as well. So um, there are uh, a few states that are out there. And I guess what maybe we could do is uh, we could email out when we email out to everybody the um, the link to the recording from today. We can also email out the um, some information about where you can find uh, some links on the asset management program. So thanks for uh, thanks for that. And it's it's pretty exciting these um, these new programs that are coming out. But obviously, it creates a number of challenges for small water systems. The Ohio plan again being finalized. Um, will include all systems in the state, um, including the, the non-community systems, uh, having to do some type of asset management plan. So uh, it's, uh, you know, interesting requirements, and we're excited in both cases to be able to provide a little bit of, a little bit of help on, for those systems. Okay. Give maybe people another minute or so if you have uh, if you have other questions. Just want to reiterate a little bit uh, while while we're just wrapping up here a point that Heather made. You know that we are uh, creating this this kind of webinar series with schools um, through Bureau of Indian Affairs and Bureau of Indian Education. Uh, they had reached out to us and uh, to see if we could provide some help. But part of our idea there is um, BIA and BIE do regular webinars with school administrators. And so I think for part of our audience there, we'll actually be talking to school principals and superintendents and others who, um, so not just maybe the operator who is running the water system and these are schools, generally speaking, that the school is its own regulated water system, though um, the concern about some of the water issues in schools goes beyond that, obviously, um, to any school that is uh, providing water to its children, whether or not they're treating and, and um, dealing with the water on their own. But um, that is something that we would like to potentially expand, as well as the um, grant management and, and a few of the other topics. Uh, we're going to be doing a lead abatement work finance workshop in Illinois this year, um, which is a, a new subject that uh, had come at special request of the state. Um, we're going to be doing a workshop in North Carolina about the financial hardship of small towns with flat or shrinking populations and the implications long term for water systems, which again is something we might be able to replicate in, in other states. Um, and uh, got a question in here from uh, Dari about, have we coordinated with the EPA Region 9 tribal program that has done a lot of outreach to our school um, lead sampling program? And I believe uh, the answer is yes. Um, again, that's Heather Center that's been taking the lead on that. 
Um, but I know that they have been involved with some of the lead sampling um, in Region 6 and I believe have coordinated with Region 9 and we'll be sure to do that in advance of the, the webinars for sure. Okay, well, I, I think with that, um, we appreciate everybody's time uh, this afternoon. Thank you for calling in and joining us or morning, depending on where you are in, in the country. Um, again, you see our contact information up there. If we can be of help at any time, uh, please let us know. Um, but we're grateful for you uh, joining today. And uh, if uh, we haven't been to your state yet, we'll be seeing you soon. And if we have, um, we'll be in touch in the fall or possibly see you at ASWA or the Capacity Development Meeting in Indianapolis in August or, or some other event. So have a great rest of the day, everybody, and a great weekend. Thanks for joining us.